I come in peace. I am an illegal alien from some other world, a permanent tourist, a cultural nomad, a smuggler who was smuggled, a dysfunctional anthropological invader that has been invaded for over 500 years. I come in peace, which should not be mistaken for I give up. No me doy por vencido, because we are under a national emergency and facing a crisis of an invasion, a threat. I am forever a pilgrim on a pilgrimage of decolonizing because not only are we facing a national emergency, it is a transnational and continental crisis of an invasion that has lasted more than 500 years. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lance, for putting this together. It's a beautiful morning. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Alan and the Bridge, for hosting this. Uh, it's beautiful to be here with you all um, and to share a bit of, of my work. Good morning to you all. Right, that worked. <laughs> this drawing is, uh, is my brother's, David Cuatlacuatl, and uh, I love it so much. Um, I find that we, we overlap a lot in our practice. Um, he was a painter, uh, and we both got our, our MFAs together on the same weekend, and, and I find this to be <laughs> such a special drawing that I um, discovered in his sketches. Um, I'm really interested in the immigration experience um, in terms of time and space from the emotional perspective. Um, I'm really interested in how we as immigrants have this specific attachment to time and space that has sort of driven us to exist in a vortex or limbo of time and space, the binational li uh, life, the transnational lifestyle that we carry across the border. I'm really uh, concerned about the emotional status and experience of an immigrant uh, when he or she leaves the past, subsists in the present, and wants to return to the past and the future, right? And we have to live with this uncertainty of uh, this ongoing hope that we're gonna return one day uh, to our home, to our past, right? Uh, most immigrants come here with the idea that we're gonna be here a year and then go back eventually. And you see this back, uh, as, for example, in my community with a lot of uh, huge empty houses. These houses that in ways represent this living hope, this living spirit that we're gonna go back one day. Um, I'm really interested in how we as immigrants come from some of the most marginalized sectors of Mexico and Latin America. And oftentimes what this means is that we are carrying a weight full of history, culture, and tensions, political tensions, social tensions that we carry across the border. Um, and so I, I often see this as, as a weight that we, that we have to carry across the border, but that it also affects our diaspora and assimilation here in the States. Um, I'm constantly acknowledging that the 500 years of oppression and marginalization, uh, specifically with indigenous communities who are the most oppressed and marginalized in Latin America. And what this often means is that immigrants in the States oftentimes have a lot of indigenous heritage and a lot of this historical weight to also unpackage and, and, to, and to deal with at the same time being an undocumented immigrant. So I've, I've been spending some time developing a visual language that tries to capture this current transculturation and also a neoculturation, right? In other words, what does it look like for current new generations arriving in the past month, in the past year, in the past five years? Um, what does it mean for them to be in the process of pushing and pulling, absorbing and rejecting culture, right? As we assimilate, as we sort of negotiate what we identify as with and what we leave behind, right? And that's something that I'm really interested in capturing as uh, visually but also uh, emotionally, you know? What, this, what does this feel like for an immigrant to go through? How does this start affecting the diasporas regionally across the states? How does this start affecting new, new generations and how they identify? 
um, and how they start creating this new idea of cultural identity. So in this piece titled uh, Kawit, or Time, um, the idea was to desynthesize our idea of time, right? We think of time as a linear synthesis of past, present, and future, right? For an immigrant, though, it becomes a lot more complex um, that the past can be the future and the future can be the past, right? Again, this idea that we're living in a vortex or limbo of time. Uh, and especially the more direct communication there is between this U.S.-Mexico border, um, the more this tension grows, you know? um, the more people actually break this barrier, the scientific barrier that you can only live in one space and time, right? An immigrant has the capability culturally and, and emotionally to break that barrier um, by, by leading to a, a binational lifestyle, um, wanting to be a part of a broader community in the States, but still wanting to be a part of our community back home. So recently I've been asking this question a lot with my own community and oftentimes what happens is I look inward uh, at my own narrative and experience to amplify, to, uh, to speak about a more broader and collective experience of, of immigrants. And so um, I recently premiered this short experimental documentary which asks my community, when are, when are we going to go back and are we going to go back and what is this current sort of emotional status for you all? but also paying attention to the material culture um, in the different regions that my community has settled, right? So I traveled to California where there's a pocket of my community. The main concentration is in Indiana. There's some folks in Iowa, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, uh, and Philadelphia. And so I'm really interested in how everyone sort of assimilated differently and how everyone has a different sense of identity. Uh, everyone has a different sense of um, community based on regionally where they have settled. Um, so let me play you the brief trailer of this documentary. Fue muy difícil aquí llegar sin nada. I also thought I would mention this current project that's installed here in the bridge and that I've been working over the last year or so. Um, this project actually started as a direct response to the Nazis being on campus and in Charlottesville in August. And I was thinking how to respond as an artist uh, through a creative uh, way and also through tradition and culture. And so the thinking with this project is tradition and culture as political weapons, right? And how do we push forward this discourse uh, in alignment with cultural sustainability? And what I realized is that the tiki torches that they used uh, automatically became a symbol of hate, no? And I was trying to think how to deconstruct this discourse and, and retake and reclaim that conversation and deliver something back using culture and tradition. Um, and so what I came up with initially is how to take a tiki torch, deconstruct it, use the material and rebuild it into a kite, a traditional kite from Mexico. This has been a, a beautiful project in the sense that it has allowed me an extension to reach into a community and work alongside a community, to do workshops, to do uh, flying sessions. And what I've done is I, I came up with a really simple instruction, step-by-step, uh, -step on how to deconstruct the tiki torch and how it becomes a kite. 
uh, I've done workshops on campus and off campus, uh, uh, specifically also with the Latinx community and trying to bring more presence and more voice um, to these communities who unfortunately have gone into the shadows because of the current political climate. This project has evolved over the, over the last year, uh, especially as I'm working with um, a kite maker from Mexico, the best kite maker in the country from Mexico. A shout out to him. His name is Pedro Guacuas. Um, and he is definitely an engineer. He's putting together these complex models uh, and putting the engineering and the aesthetics behind. And so some of these models that you see installed in here are a direct co uh, binational collaboration with Pedro Guacuas. Um, and I've also extended into new materials, for example, the pyramid shape one, which you see in the back here, is made out of uh, Starbucks straws. Uh, so in a way, these, this, this process, this whole gesture of making and flying kites becomes sort of a political irreverent gesture as well, right? The act of making kites and flying them as a political act, as a peaceful protest. Therefore, the, the kites are all white to signify that this is a peaceful protest uh, that shouldn't be confused with I give up. Lastly, I wanted to share um, the Rascuache project, which I'll play a slideshow of images as I talk about this project. I came here in the States when I was seven in 1999 and I couldn't travel back to Mexico until late 2016, um, until I had DACA and I had to get a permit to travel back. And so my brother and I were thinking on how were we gonna travel back and uh, avoid being tourists in our own territory, in our own, um, in our own communities. And how did we make out of this experience a broader experience to share with other artists and scholars and celebrate local um, indigenous artists and also local um, talent from, my com from our community. And so we, we launched this residency, Rascuache Artist Residency in, in our hometown. Uh, it was also paying tribute to my parents' home who, um, that had been unoccupied for 20 years, an empty house that had been unoccupied. Um, and the idea was how to activate the space um, and give it a life or a spirit again with, with all of these activities, um, inviting artists over and the community to do workshops, lectures, projects um, alongside the community. The name Rascuache comes from a Mesoamerican term that means somebody from the lower class, somebody that is poor, somebody that has bad taste, somebody that is uneducated. Oftentimes, as you may already assume, this, this was used to uh, insult indigenous uh, communities, peoples in Mexico. And what happened is in the 1960s, Chicanos in California took this term and shifted it around, right? And said, no, this is, this is not um, a negative term to be used for indigenous communities or, or the lower class. This is actually a dignified lifestyle. And this is furthermore a uh, artistic style to think and produce in the Rascuache form, right? The main concept behind Rascuache is how to make the most from the least, right? It's how to use what is in proximity or at hand. And for us, what this means is how to shift around the thinking of an artist of rather than relying on expensive or fancy facilities and resources, how can we work alongside a community and have a perspective of culture and community as the resource to work with. Um, and so oftentimes we're challenging artists to arrive to the residency and be in communication, be in relationship with a community. And how does that become resourceful to produce thinking and artwork, right? Um, we just wrapped up the third edition uh, last summer. We're now ready for the fourth edition this summer. And it's an exciting new phase that we're gonna be working on the next three to five years. Um, we've rethought what does it mean to be a successful residency? Does it make sense to be bringing in renowned artists or outsiders into the community and produce things or objects or artworks as, as uh, objects? And so we've actually shifted that conversation around to think a bit more alternatively, a bit more in alignment with what the community needs or wants, 
right? And so what we've come up with is um, an artist residency that doesn't necessarily produce things or objects, but that produces experiences, advances, and change alongside a community. We're not mainly focused on what we produce as objects, but we're mainly focused on that process. You know, what does it mean to paint alongside a community, and how does that benefit both the artist and the community at the same time? Um, and so over the next three to five years, we're going to be working on an experimental library, um, building an archive of what exists already, and, and having that be the resource for artists coming in in the future. At the same time as celebrating indigenous artists from the region and from the country of Mexico um, to, to essentially create out of this residency uh, an art and cultural center. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah, the, the question is, is there anything being done with the, the experience on the other side of the border, right, south of the border? And the answer is, is yes. It's become, for me personally, it's become much more complicated and emotionally charging to go back to Mexico for the first time in 2016, and I'm still in the process of unpackaging all of this, like, concerns and issues now. But um, one thing I forgot to mention is one of the emphasis of the residency is to pay attention to that, to highlight the local issues of the community, especially since more than half of the community is in the states, right? And so you can feel the loneliness, the, the sadness, the, the melancholic sort of feeling in the community. And so we are acknowledging that there are elders who have been waiting for their, for their kids to come back for more than 30 years. And there are kids whose parents left them behind when they were only a few months old and have also been waiting for so many years. And so we're trying to respond to that through the residency and through, through projects with the, with the community. Other questions? Um, do you find that there's, have you noticed that there's any kind of momentum or initiative here amongst the Latino communities in terms of trying to share or cultivate or produce some kind of an experience or process given their specific experiences here as immigrants? Yes, not directly with this concern of how do we, how, how do we go through therapy, no? Or how do we sort of repair ourselves, no? There isn't that internal discourse in the community. And there won't ever be because for, uh, for these communities, that's almost like a luxury, you know, to go to therapy. And, but what there, what there is is this beautiful thing um, of if we can't go back home, can we bring home here? No? And so I've noticed that um, there's been initiatives to bring traditions and celebrations into the states and to also voice that we want to be part of this broader community, right? Look at us, look at our tradition, um, give us some visibility, you know, because most, most immigrant communities have to deal with this invisibility and visibility at the same time. And so this carnival is now celebrated, originally in, in my home state, is now celebrated in Indianapolis and then in Philly uh, in a couple weeks actually, and, and it turns out to be such a colorful and big uh, carnival that takes the streets and, and you know, voices that uh, we want to be here and we want to be a part of your community. Questions? Will you go to either of those carnivals? Yes, I've been going to them. Um, they started in, I want to say 2015, so it's fairly recent, and I've been paying attention to a lot of that because uh, these costumes can be $3,000 for each one, and so th it says a lot from a community to say we are willing to invest not only our money but our time, effort, um, to to um, put forward our efforts and being part of the, uh, a broader community, and so I've I've been working with with uh, these participants uh, since 2015, mainly more from Indianapolis. Yes. Yeah. What is that carnival? What is the celebration of that carnival? The carnival from my home state um, is is officially called Carnival of Huejotzingo, which celebrates the battle that took place in Puebla. Mexico, 
And it, it also sort of weaves in other historical and cultural moments of Mexico. It celebrates the first indigenous Catholic wedding. It also, um, it also initiated as a way of indigenous communities mocking the colonizers and wanting to be a part of a community, but at the same time sort of in resistance, no? And it, it also has the seven soldiers that were involved in that war of Mexico. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in what you said about peace not meaning giving up. Could you elaborate on that, what that means for you? Yeah, I think, I think we have to acknowledge um, culturally and nationally that the white flag in a war zone is not a transcultural understanding. In the States, a white flag means peace. I give up to you, right? I've lost. Outside of this country, a white flag in a war zone means let's negotiate, let's talk, let's enter into conversation, no? And, and that's, that's basically what these are, are saying. Other questions? Yes. Is that generated from, like at this celebration that is coming up in Philadelphia, is that kind of a conversation going on there? Um, what, what's happening as a result of it? That, I mean, that carnival in Philly is, is independent of its own. They, they organize that independently. They're putting together their own resources to, to put that together. Um, but w basically what they're, what they're doing is bringing their tradition from home here and, and saying, let's all celebrate this. Let's all talk about um, tradition and culture as a broader community. Yeah. So what fears, if any, do you have about the whitewashing of traditions that are brought into this country? Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful question, a really complex one. I don't think it's, it can be easy to, to think about that, but in terms of fear, an immigrant, an undocumented immigrant is, becomes numb to fear. An immigrant becomes sort of fearless because we have to drive around without a license. We have to be willing to get arrested. We have to be willing to get deported if we fly. Uh, oftentimes, we're actually not flying. Um, so fear becomes a very distorted and blurry notion for us, right? We're willing to do anything or give up anything for, for these advances, no? We were already willing to give up our lives going through that border, right? So by the time we come here, it, you know, this, this idea of fear is, is very distorted. Yes? What brought you to Charlottesville, and what has been your experience uh, living in this community at this time? What has brought me to Charlottesville, and what has been my experience so far? Um, I came here because I had the opportunity to work at UVA as an assistant professor in the Department of Art, which has been a beautiful opportunity. My experience has been beautiful in the sense that I came at a, uh, I guess, uh, a good timing. No? I arrived the same weekend as the Nazis arrived. And for me, uh, first of all, it was concerning, but then I realized that it was very powerful. It was really powerful in the sense that my work would become more meaningful and a lot more useful in, 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 um, in a community. Right, and so I've I've seen it that way. I've I've noticed that there's an overwhelmingly amount of content to be working with and to be responding to, and there's there's an urgency of needs. No, personally, I'm more invested in the Latinx community, but of course, I'm interested in, in how we are moving forward as an entire community. How to inspire a community or talk to a community to move forward with all sorts of scars and pain. I mean, that's I think that that's something we're all facing daily now. Um, I don't know, I think that's something we figure out all together as a community. How do we help each other out, no? It's not only how does that Mexican or immigrant help out their community, their immigrant or Mexican community, but actually how does this become an intersectional effort of advances, no? How does this become a, a collective solidarity as we move forward? Yeah, um, I think so the thinking or this sort of nuance of how do we operate as artists outside of galleries and institutions now. I think it, it's a very urgent way of thinking right now as, as 21st century artists, not, and not just visual artists, of course, right? But it does not make sense for me to be selling work about issues, pressing issues, 
that I've gone through that my community is still going, going through. It makes a lot more sense rather than making things to make things happen, no? to produce experiences and advances and change. You know, you mentioned um, the current political climate in the United States, and uh, it worries me that people think we all feel that way, and we don't. And I apologize. Thank you for your apology. I think um, we don't all feel that way because we're all different races, we're all different experiences, we're all different um, real lived experiences, no? And of course we don't all feel that way. I think the important thing is to, to empathize, to connect, to build solidarity, and to understand, no, that, that we all don't feel that way, but how does that lead to productive discourse and conversation? Yeah. Can, can you tell us how we might be able to engage your work this weekend? Any opportunities? <laughs> Yeah, let's all have a peaceful protest. Um, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow at Market Street Park, which is what they call it now, yeah? And uh, I'm gonna be working with high schoolers, Latinx local high schoolers, to build, build these kites. And again, the idea is how to uh, fly and make these kites as a form of peaceful protest. So you're all invited tomorrow at, I wanna say, 1.30? Um, at Market Street. And then the opening for this exhibition is on Sunday. There's going to be some projection. The other face of this project is how to track, 3D track the motion of the kites as they're flying in the air and how to convert those into archived um, animations. Actually, I was curious about that. Can you just talk about the, that awesome animation piece that you made and that we saw today? And talk, can you talk about it? <laughs> Yeah, that, that first animation that I showed um, is, is talking a lot about the past, the future, and the present coexisting. And what does that look like visually, you know? And, and how does that start talking about this emotional feeling for an immigrant to, to have that complex sort of understanding of time? Because for us, we're, we're constantly carrying this weight of 500 years of oppression, though. Know? And, and we're also subsisting in this presence and this first world um, country presented with technologically and, and economically advanced ways of, of living now. And for oftentimes there's a, there's a clash or there's some friction in terms of a capitalist lifestyle and an indigenous lifestyle now back home. And so visually I'm, I'm constantly trying to, to wrestle with that.